So let's start. So this is the first image you see on screen. What is this? What do you see on screen? You see a map, right? And you see something called the Broad Street Pump written here. Okay, so what is this map which you see on screen? This is called a spot map. And when you hear spot map, two things should come to your mind. One disease and the name of one person. Yes, we are talking about Jon Snow. The real Jon Snow we are talking about. This is for you to remember. Okay, so Jon Snow and Cholera. So spot map was devised by Jon Snow. So I hope you know the story. Long story in store. There was a cholera outbreak in London. At that time, we did not know about the uh, uh, cholera disease or we did not know about the agent that is that is Viprio cholerae. It was not known. Okay. But what John Snow did was he plotted or he marked the houses where the cases of this uh, watery diarrhea was present. And he saw that all these cases were scattered or they were actually clustered around the pump, which is the uh, Broad Street pump. And these people, those who were affected, were actually taking water from this particular pump. So that he came to the conclusion that it was this, you know, polluted water that was creating uh, the disease in these people. So this was a, a very famous public health, you know, story we have. So a spot map can be asked as an image-based question and you should be able to identify John Snow, who is known as the father of, father of epidemiology, okay? And what is the, who is the, who or what is the father of public health? That is cholera. Father of public health is not a person, but it's a disease which is cholera. Okay. Just like that, another disease which has a catchy phrase is your TB, tuberculosis, is known as the barometer of social welfare. Okay. So that was the first image. Now, moving on to the next image, this is a MTPI or multi-dimensional poverty index. Here I put this because they can ask you, in the morning we had already discussed the human development index and PQLI. Just like that, they can ask you about the domains that are coming under other indicators like the MTPI, which is a multi-dimensional poverty index. Then they can ask you about the GHI or the uh, hunger index. Okay. So this is the MTPI. Under MTPI, we have the three domains which you can remember as she, S-H-E. S is for standard of living, H is for health, and E is for education, okay? So these are the main three things that we are assessing in the multidimensional poverty index, standard of living, uh, health, and education. And under each, we have certain indicators. For example, health is measured by nutrition and child mortality. For education, you see years of schooling and school attendance. For living standards, you see different things like cooking fuel, sanitation, drinking water, electricity, housing, assets, etc. Okay? So... That is one index. Then this is your GHI or the Global Hunger Index. So what all are the components of the Global hun Hunger Index? Mainly we have three things. One is you're measuring the inadequate food supply. Second one is child undernutrition, child malnutrition or to be specific child undernutrition. Then you have child mortality. So these are the three things which we are taking into consideration while calculating the GHI or Global Hunger Index. When I say child undernutrition, it again has two components. The index 1 sixth is composed by your wasting and 1 sixth by stunting. Then you have child mortality totally contributing to one third of the GHI. Inadequate food supply also one third. So how to remember the components of the GHI? So just remember this image, this particular child. If this image is there in your mind, you'll be able to write out the components. See, the child is having a food with inadequate food supply. So that is one. Then the child is looking very much undernourished or malnourished. So that is the second one. And see, there is mortality behind him or mortality is following him. So these are the three things that comes under your global hunger index. And the latest value is uh, India GHI is 28.7. We are at a very bad rank of 111 out of the 125 countries. Okay. So next image is from your epidemics, types of epidemic or we, we have this image in the concept of health and disease as well as in the uh, starting part of your epidemiology chapters. So first tell me what is an epidemic? Epidemic is when there is an excess number of cases from more than that is expected. From the normal, if there is an excess in the number of cases, then you say there is an epidemic. Sometimes it's not even the number, it's just above the normal that is important. For example, smallpox, you know, it has been eradicated. So even one case of smallpox reported is an epidemic. 
because normal is zero so even one becomes an epidemic in case of smallpox okay so now you'll be asked different types of epidemic and you should know the epidemic curve as well as the related points okay so before that we'll just classify the epidemic now this is the this is the point source epidemic you see here then this is the continuous uh, common continuous source and then you have a propagated source. so before going into detail we'll just roughly study the classification of the epidemic okay let me just add one page here so how do you classify epidemics so epidemics can be either common source epidemic epidemic arising from a common source for example food poisoning okay then you have your propagated or progressive epidemics these are epidemics which transmit from person to person or maybe through arthropod vector your covid 19 is a propagated epidemic right then the third one is your slow epidemic or modern epidemic this we won't be discussing here this for completion i'm saying it here so slow or modern epidemic mainly your n series these are regarded as the slow or modern epidemic so mainly you should know the majors for this common source epidemic as well as propagated epidemic so the first graph you see here you see here see this is an example of a point source epidemic so you see in the epidemic curve you have the days here on the side and you have the number of cases plotted on the y axis same thing only time and number of cases you are representing it as a curve so in the point source epidemic what happens is there is a single point source for example all of you 10 people of you go to a, a go to a party where you are taking food which is uh, contaminated with salmonella so you get food poisoning so that food is the common source so all of you who have gone there who have had the food all the 10 of you will be developing food poisoning in one particular incubation period in one incubation period all of you will be developing the will be developing the disease and how will the curve look like it will be just a single curve you don't have multiple curves it's just a single curve and that is the common point source epidemic okay so we'll just write down the important points if you see here see fed right i draw it in the form of a curve it's just a single curve that you're getting here so point source epidemic also known as single exposure epidemics most important point is all cases develop in one incubation period okay and how is the curve looking this is how it will be the curve will be having a sharp rise and a sharp fall because all cases are clustered in one single incubation period so your curve will be just like this will have a sharp rise and a sharp fall okay then no secondary waves and this is also called as explosive because it's just a sharp rise and a sharp fall that's why you are called as a explosive best example would be food poisoning food contamination even pollutants pollution air pollution pollutants and all can be an example for a common source point source epidemic then next one is a common continuous source epidemic epidemic for example maybe viral hepatitis a outbreak from july to september or maybe some people are there is a contaminated just like our uh, you know the example of johns moon the cholera example is a contaminated water source from where people are taking water so there is like it's a common source but continuously people are getting infected because of taking water from that particular water body that can can be an example of a common continuous source epidemic here what you see is you get multiple curves unlike the point source we told we just have a single curve sharp rise sharp fall here you're getting you know because it's a continuous exposure you're getting multiple multiple curves like this this is the characteristic feature of a common continuous source epidemic so you have multiple continuous or if it's intermittent exposure you'll get intermittent curves and that too for a prolonged time it's not like a sharp rise and fall multiple small curves for a prolonged time that's how you get the common continuous source epidemic and extends to more than one incubation period that is again important okay now for propagated source you have it's person to person transmission 
this is how your this thing uh, your epidemic curve will look like it doesn't have a very sharp rise but it will rise rise progressively and then at a point when most of the population has got the infection when your community becomes you know immune to the infection or the susceptible community decreases you know what happens is slightly your curves can to fall down or plateauing occurs this is characteristic of your propagated epidemic you can also always remember your covid 19 polio all these are examples of your propagated outbreak okay so these are the three diagrams i'll just show you once again so this is the po point source epidemic you should know this image as well as this uh, curve curve wala image also sorry then you have a common continuous source and finally this is the image of a propagated source this can be asked as a image based question so now what is this what do you see on screen this is your iceberg or iceberg phenomenon so nobody is going to ask you what is this okay they'll point out something maybe they'll find out this line what does this line of demarcation mean or what is the significance of the submerged portions you can get questions like that based on this iceberg phenomenon so you know it right iceberg is diseases in a community certain diseases in a community can be combat to an iceberg where you only see the tip of the iceberg which is the clinical cases that come to a doctor but there is a huge submerged tip, submerged portion of the iceberg beneath which will include all your subclinical cases the carriers everything there so as far as the public health specialist is concerned more than the tip we are more concerned with the submerged portion of the iceberg okay so this floating tip you see here this is what the clinician sees floating tip these are the either the clinical cases or even the death whatever is visible comes in the floating tip so this vast submerged portion you see here this is the hidden mass it can include your latent in apparent you know carriers then your undiagnosed cases all this chunk comes in this submerged portion and for as an as an epidemiologist i'll be more concerned with this submerged portion of the iceberg okay and what is the line of demarcation line of demarcation is the line between your apparent and in apparent infection and what is the water surrounding the iceberg this is your healthy population the iceberg is a disease population and your water surrounding is the healthy population okay and where do you apply screening test and where do you apply diagnostic test at this visible place you apply the diagnostic test and for the asymptomatic or the invisible cases you have to go for your screening test okay now iceberg phenomenon is not shown by tell me three diseases which do not show iceberg phenomenon that means these, these diseases do not have a subclinical or a submerged submerged uh, phase so one rabies rabies does not have iceberg phenomenon if you get rabies you will be developing the symptoms and all very evidently within a very few days and you know it is very fatal also so one is rabies then you have tetanus and measles these three diseases do not show iceberg phenomenon this your iceberg phenomenon rabies measles tetanus okay which do not show the iceberg phenomenon now we'll move on to the next question what do you see here this is a see a nest also here that's a clue and the name is already written there so this is a nested case control study so we know about case of control studies we know about cohort studies we know about positional studies everything now we have two different study designs one is the nested case control study another one is the case cohort study these are actually studies embedded within a cohort you know cohort study is a very expensive uh, longitudinal study which takes years to happen so you are having a in a cohort study you have an exposed group you have an unexposed group you are following them up for a free period of time maybe 10 years 20 years whatever and then you are going to check for the outcome so why not do a smaller study in between this time that is exactly what you are doing in a nested case control study so this is a defined cohort that is happening there within that cohort you are doing a case control study because see we are following up the uh, exposed and non exposed people so in that at some point of time some people start developing the disease those disease persons in your cohort you choose them as your cases so when a person when a person develops a disease he becomes case one simultaneously you choose another person who 
does not have the disease from that same cohort. So he becomes the control one. Similarly, when there is a case two, then you get a you select a control also for the same case. Then at uh, around maybe four or five years, you get two more cases, case three and case four. So simultaneously, you choose controls three and four. So now what you have within that cohort, you have some cases, you have some controls. So you can easily do a case control study. So this type of case control study, which is embedded within a cohort, is called a nested case control study. And it has, why are we doing this? Because it does definitely has many advantages over the normal case control study. One thing, in case control study, we know, recall bias is very common because we are actually going back and getting the exposure. But in a case, in a nested case control study, since we are doing this study within a cohort, the baseline information of all the cases and controls are already there. During the start of the cohort, we would have already taken all this information. Blood test investigation, everything will be there. So that data is there already with us. Plus, it is cheap, it is inexpensive. So there are many advantages for a nested case control study. So this image shows the nested, it's a diagrammatic representation of a nested case control study. Now we have a very similar study to this, which is the second image that I'm going to show you. This is a case cohort study. Just like the nested case control study, like if this is embedded within the cohort study, but you take cases, case 1, case 2, case 3, case 4 at a time. Simultaneously, you are not taking controls. There, you are actually simultaneously taking a control. So here, you are not taking control simultaneously. Maybe here, at the end of 5 years, I got 5 cases. Now, at the end of 5 years, I am just taking 5 controls. Instead of taking 1 control when each case develops, finally, I am taking my total n number of controls corresponding to the cases at the end. This is the case cohort study. Okay. So this also is important. Now, this is another study design which we have not discussed in the morning. So you see here, you see the x-axis and y-axis. Here they are in the y-axis, they have the per capita alcohol consumption and the x-axis they are showing the death rates due to CHT. Okay. And when you see the unit of the study, it's not a person. They have, they have actually quoted countries. It's France, Italy, Germany, Switzerland. Okay, so the unit of study is a population in this. And it's not an individual or it's not a patient here. So this kind of study where the unit of study is a population is called a ecological study. Sometimes it's also called as a correlational study. So basically what they do is instead of taking single persons and then getting the exposure and comparing, as a population you are comparing, unit of study becomes the population. For example, in this case what they are doing, they are comparing the alcohol consumption of countries and comparing to the heart death due to heart diseases of that particular country. So instead of a person, you are comparing populations. But there is one issue with this, that is called the ecological fallacy. What do you mean by ecological fallacy? See, I told you in ecological studies, what you're doing is you're comparing populations and populations you're comparing, it's not individuals. So here, according to this study, I can say that countries with uh, more alcohol consumption have more heart diseases or heart attacks. That is my inference. But suppose if I take a single person from a country, suppose I'm choosing one person from Switzerland who had a heart attack. And according to my theory, I am saying that because of more alcohol consumption, you're having heart attack. But when I take that single person, he might not be an alcoholic or he might not have even touched alcohol in his lifetime. So my assumption becomes wrong when I'm taking a single case instead of focusing on the whole population. This is called ecological fallacy. Simply meaning that whatever you are implying for a population or whatever inference you're making based on a population might not be true when you're considering an individual from that population. This fallacy that comes is called the ecological fallacy, which is a drawback of your ecological studies. Okay.